Thank you. We begin this morning with a shared prayer, a call to worship for Lent and the sign of the covenant. If you could please join your hearts with mine in a prayerful way as we responsively uh, worship together, this, starting with this prayer. In the days of Noah, God placed a rainbow in the sky as the sign of a covenant of God's love for all the earth. In the colors of the rainbow, we see the sign of God's grace for all creation. In the days of Moses, the words of God were written on tablets of stone as the sign of a covenant between God and all of God's people. In the tablets of stone, we see the sign of God's hope for each to live in peace with God and neighbor. In the days of the prophet, God promised to place a new covenant in our hearts. As members of the living body of Christ, we see the sign of God's promise among us. We continue with our prayer of confession in this Lenten season. God gave us the covenant of the law to guide us and help us live with our neighbors in love. When we break God's law, we leave our neighbors hurt and bruised. God's law is a gift to us showing us how to keep our part of the covenant. Even through our old pain and wounds, may we embrace the new life that Christ can bring. And finally, the words of assurance in response to our prayer of confession. May the God of the law guide us in living lives that keep the covenant of love. May Christ's forgiveness grant us new life even when we break God's law. May the Holy Spirit of conviction lead us to confession and renewal. May we respond in love to the God of covenant and change. Our first hymn this morning is Christ is the World's Light. You will find it in the red hymnal uh, in the rack in the pews ahead of you. It is number 188. Please stand, whether in body or in spirit and lift your voices in worship.
Thank you. Please be seated. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced anything similar. I'm sure you have. It seems to be part of the human condition. I, on Monday, when I put together the bulletin, said, a time for young at heart Christians. And Sunday, as I prepared my folder here before you, it is not here. I forgot to create it. <sighs> Thanks, Anne. That lightens it tremendously. <laughs> but this week, we are talking about promises and covenants. And so I would say to those of you who consider yourself young at heart Christians, that often we get off track when it comes to remembering that we are in covenant with God. As disciples of Jesus Christ, our faith is based on a history of covenants between the people of God and God. And so just a quiet, hopefully kind reminder that please don't get so caught up in the busyness of the day that you forget things and leave them at home, outside of your folder in front of you. But more than that, within your hearts, keep those promises those relationships, first and foremost. Don't let yourself be distracted and lose sight of what is important on any day, not just on a Sunday. Amen? Amen. Amen. Annie, the best I could do on short notice. There is a time to praise God with song, and I'm thankful that this is the time that we will welcome our choir with our anthem this week.
My thanks to Debbie and Anthony and the choir for such lovely music today. And if there is a time to praise God with song, there is a time to praise God with word. We begin this morning with a reading from the Old Testament and the epistles. Thank you. Something I forgot that I was reading the scripture this morning. So my apologies if there are rough spots. I think there's some of that going around. Yes, indeed. God bless you. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <clears throat> not, not due to anyone's fault but my own. Just want to make that clear. Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The next reading is from Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10. From death to life. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and the lectionary selection is actually verses 14 through 21. But I am choosing to begin with the first verse, um, to give you some background about Nicodemus. I think it, would, it is good information to keep in mind as you hear the verses from the lectionary. Nicodemus visits Jesus. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. 
Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. We continue with verse 14. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, and so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It would, of course, be difficult to preach this text from Numbers that you just heard without making reference to the gospel reading for this week. It is John's explication, his analysis, and development of this story that fits most neatly into our Lenten journey. John has Jesus reference this story from Numbers as a way of explaining what he, Jesus, was there to do. It is the first reference of being lifted up and goes back to a story with snakes and poison and grumbling people. In the immortal words of Indiana Jones, snakes, why does it always have to be snakes? What could be so uplifting about a story of a snake on a stick? That sounds like a question that Nicodemus would ask, although the gospel text for the week moves to the explanation verses after the encounter in the night between Jesus and Nicodemus. It would probably be helpful to remember how we got there, and thus my decision to read those earlier verses for you. We need to consider why Jesus made the reference to the snake in the desert and give perhaps the most famous verse in the whole New Testament, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. So how did we get here? My beloveds, it started with Nicodemus. 
Nicodemus, as you, as you just heard, was a leader of the people of God. He was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, the governing body of the Jews in Israel at Jesus' time. He comes at night to see Jesus, maybe because serious study takes place at night, or maybe because he was afraid of being seen associating with this questionable rabbi from the backwoods. He comes with social niceties, a bit of flattery to grease the wheels of conversation. But Jesus immediately changes the subject. Did you hear that? Immediately, he's not having any of it. He puts Nicodemus on the defensive. You have to be a different person to be part of what God has in store, he tells him. You can almost hear the pause. You can almost hear that word saying itself. What? What are you saying to me? Nicodemus is reeling almost immediately. He's knocked off his feet. He spends the rest of the conversation simply trying to catch up. He makes a feeble joke about climbing back into his mother's womb, hoping to disarm the intensity of the teacher because being born a different person was couched in a metaphor about birth. Born again, he said, born from above. And in truth, the word in Greek means both things, a reference to time and to direction. Born again as if the first time wasn't traumatic enough. Again as if the first time wasn't as full of potential as it needed to be. Again as if drawing breath like never before, filling your lungs with more than air, actually breathing in spirit instead, again as if you were too focused on this life, the one lived out in front of your eyes and anything invisible isn't real, breathing in spirit was finally understanding that anything invisible, like love and hope, and joy and transformation and possibility isn't what life was about when born from below. Now, this life we live, it's not a bad life. It's just a shallow one, just a nose to the grindstone and find your meaning in successes and failures each and every day and not in the love of a creator who stands ready to fill you with vision. Let go, Nicodemus. Let go of the need to control. Let go, beloved. Let go of the need to control. Let go of your need to have everything your way. Let go of the belief that you can build a better world, a more vibrant community by shaping it along the lines of your own preferences and understandings. Instead, grab hold of the spirit and be blown about from one world to the next, from one joy to the next, from one soul to the next. Be born into a new way of seeing. Let go of what was. No matter how satisfying it may have been, grab hold of where God is calling you to go, who God is calling you to be. Jesus might have said, I'm not telling you anything new, Nicodemus. I've been saying these things since I got here, since the beginning of time. This is all I have to say. This is all I know. This God thing, this vision of the people of God, the community of faith, I have not stopped saying this. And you are a leader of the people, and somehow you don't get it? How can this be, Nicodemus? What did you miss? Get ready. It's about to get even more intense. My beloveds, I still maintain that this is thirsty work. Jesus gave Nicodemus a whole lot of stuff to think about. It was a huge bag that I'm sure took a long time for Nicodemus to unpack. 
And I pray, I really believe that he did get into that bag and rummage around even after the meeting had ended. We don't really know how it all affected him or what he went away with that night. But a few chapters later, when the rest of the leadership is complaining that the police didn't arrest Jesus for speaking of the kingdom of God, Nicodemus speaks up and says, don't we have a due process? This is not an affirmation of faith by any means, but at least he attempts to stand on the side of right. They sneered at him and accused him of being a hick from the sticks like Jesus. And then Nicodemus shrinks from sight completely. Well, not completely. He just doesn't speak again. But he shows up in the darkness one more time. The afternoon darkness of a weeping world and gathers up the body from a horrible death and wraps it with about a hundred pounds of spices and puts it into the tomb of another Pharisee named Joseph. A hundred pounds of spices. You may ask, was that really necessary? Maybe, or maybe it was simply overboard. Maybe it was apology spice. Maybe he finally understood what he had missed that night in that meeting in the dark and wanted to make up for it by bringing so much that he could barely carry it. A penance of spice poured over a dead body that wasn't going to stay dead, though Nicodemus didn't know that yet. Because, and we're back where we need to be, Nicodemus finally had the courage or the faith or the desperation to look up and live. Look up and live. So let's look up again now, shall we, beloveds? The story from Numbers isn't about a snake and it isn't about worshiping, worshiping an odd sort of idol. It's about acknowledging that each of us needs help. We need a savior. And it's about obedience to the one who will rescue you from what is killing you if you just look up and live. It isn't a difficult thing to look up at a snake on a stick or a man dying on a cross, yet it is the hardest thing we could ever do as free thinking human beings. It's about surrendering ourselves to that which will save us rather than thinking we can do it ourselves if we just plug away at it long enough. It is admitting that there is a poison in our system that will kill us if we don't do something radical, something desperate, something amazing and affirming, something that displays our faith and illustrates the covenant that we each have with God through Jesus Christ. It isn't hard to imagine the squeamishness of the Hebrew people to have a bronze snake on a pole in the midst of the camp while they were surrounded by snakes literally nipping at their heels. We can be sure that their prayer was that God would move the snakes out of the way and give them a clear path on their journey. But God chose a different way. God left the snakes around them, left them vulnerable to the poison that could kill them, yet God gave them a remedy, a solution to the danger that literally surrounded them. All they needed to do was to look up and live. Dear ones, we face the same decision today. And I ask you, are we willing to look up and live? Are we willing to lift our eyes to God in all circumstances of our life? Are we willing to embrace a covenant, a relationship with the Holy One? 
Jesus Christ? Can we surrender ourselves to seek God by letting go literally of our independence? Will we, are we willing to look outside of ourselves? Can we, will we look up and live? My beloveds, I pray that we all finally do in the face of all of the situations we encounter each and every day of our lives, please always remember to lift your eyes to God, to live fully in relationship. May it be so today and every day. Amen? Amen. The hymn that Debbie picked this week is so beautiful. So please find your red hymnal and turn to number 560. When you find your place, please stand, whether in body or in spirit, and lift your voice in worship. Please be seated. I say almost every week that my favorite parts of coming together in worship revolve around these two things, that we share our joys and concerns when we gather in community. Sometimes we speak them aloud, sometimes we hold them in our heart, but we acknowledge that there is a need that is just weighing us down. And so we lift all of those joys and concerns into God's keeping when we come together in prayer. I am using this week um, a prayer that was written by Sophia Fausa in 2020. 
It's a re in remembrance of important things, a pastoral prayer for the fourth Sunday of Lent. I don't want to take credit for her words. They are lovely. And I hope that you can be in an attitude of prayer with me at this time. Sweet and precious God, almighty and awesome in glory, yet so near and so concerned about our hearts. Thank you for knowing and loving us with an everlasting love. Time and time again, we have messed up and relived the oh so common, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again. We've attempted to bargain a favor on a promissory note that we may make void almost daily. But thank you, God, that even though you know we are headed to sin again, you not only still love us unconditionally, but you offer us forgiveness, the opportunity to have a clean record, a get out of jail free card that bears the title, new grace and mercy every morning. So allow us, O oh God, to not become complacent in our daily journey. Forgive us for not moving as fast as we should have in the past and for not helping someone in need when we could have. You have given us the spirit of discernment, but please give us the wisdom to see beyond the transitory things of life and find you and your sustaining presence that we may be a blessing to others. You know the silent cries in our hearts. We know that you have already met the need. Now God, tap into our hearts true desires. Touch families, friends, and most importantly, our neighbors, because when you are blessing our neighbors, we know you're in our neighborhood and you're headed to our house. So thank you for being sovereign in our lives, giving us the power to speak over our own lives, the lives around us, and to love one another with the love of Christ. We will continue to give you glory, honor, and praise, believing that your grace is sufficient enough for us and your love endures forever and it is in the matchless name of jesus that we pray in one voice our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And the next favorite part of the service is that when we gather in community, we each week not only give our gifts and tithes for the work of this church in this community and the world, but we also figuratively place ourselves into this plate and re-offer ourselves to the work of the kingdom here in this place and ultimately also in the world. Thank you.
Our final hymn is also in the red hymnal. It's to God be the glory. It's number 99. Please join your voice with mine. Just a moment, if you don't mind. More of that forgetfulness is go, is, can be found in the service today. I do apologize. We failed to pray together to dedicate the offering that was collected. And so let us, as in one voice, dedicate this offering this morning. Compassionate God, we offer you these gifts as signs of our time and labor. Receive the offering of our lives and feed us with your grace that in the midst of death, all creation, we might feast on your unending life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now as we prepare to go forward to live the church, to ministry in all, to all the world, hear this prayer of benediction. As God has shared the best with you, now you are challenged to go forth to share your blessings with others. May the peace and the love of God go with you always. Amen. Peace be with you.